All right, and with this, I wish you a wonderful good evening and welcome to this, um, yeah, this February event with our guest, Dennis, uh, from the UK. So first of all, yes, this is an online meeting because Dennis is living in the UK and unfortunately now we have to apply for visa. Okay, yeah, this is now a little more difficult and he didn't want to go through the hassle and so we just invited him for an online talk which I believe is, is perfectly fine and definitely much better than not having a talk at all. So now before we go to this main talk, as usually I have a few words to say just to, to give an idea what, um, what you can expect today. So first, I would like to mention why we're using Zoom today. So I admit this is a total experiment of ours. Dennis mentioned that he would like this to be a little more interactive. Uh, he wants to ask questions, he wants to have feedback, he wants to have um, raised hands. And so I thought this just works better with Zoom. And so we agreed that this could be, should probably be a Zoom meeting. Um, this is not what we now plan to do forever, but it is a nice experiment. If this works well, then indeed in the future, we could, um, could try this again. I should now also mention that when I set up the Zoom meeting, I have a license for up to 100 participants. But then 240 people registered. And then I was a little uh, nervous and I asked Zoom if I could get a license for up to 300 people. But I unfortunately only sell this kind of license for up to, for, from starting from 10 licenses. And this is not what I wanted to afford. But then Daniel, Daniel Teubel, um, was so kind to uh, suggest that we use the, TU, the Technical University Munich uh, license. And now this is why um, today we are indeed kind of officially hosted by the TU Munich. So thank you very much for that. This is really very much appreciated. All right, then I have some other good news. Uh, we have extended our organizer team. So kind of officially now uh, from today on, but as I asked him in January already, Miro Kneip is now officially a, uh, a MOOC++ organizer. I'm super happy about this because Miro is, I believe, just the right person for this job. So he is First of all, very well first in C++, yeah, technically an expert, but then he is also going to conferences. He is speaking himself, and so he has connections into the community. So I think this is just what, what an organizer should have. So thank you, Miro, for uh, doing this job, which is not a terrible job, I promise. And um, for all of you, if you see Miro and have anything to suggest, like hosting an event, uh, giving a talk, etc., just um, Feel free to address me as well. Okay, last item. This is now a Zoom call. And you might remember that usually in these online meetings, we host an after talk chat after our, our usual stream, um, so Twitch stream. Today it's different because it is a Zoom meeting already. So after the talk, we'll probably make one, two, three minutes break because Dennis might, might actually want to go to the bathroom or whatever. But then we actually just stay in this call and we can directly chat with Dennis. So this would be your, would be your opportunity to ask questions directly, to um, yeah, just discuss the things that he's, he's talked about. And so we'd be very, very happy if many people stay for this after talk chat. But now, without further delay, let me introduce Dennis. So Dennis works at Meta doing performance for a living. He's a semi-active C++ community member, a few talks and one paper, which apparently failed in the, uh, when you proposed that. And he has um, submitted a couple of C++ standard library patches, some Chrome-based library contributions, etc. And he is one of the maintainers of the EVE open source library, which is C++, uh, sorry, which is C SIMD in C++20. And this is now exactly what I was going to talk about today. So Dennis, I give over to you and I'm very much looking forward to this talk. Yeah, uh, thank you. Hi, everybody. Yeah, so the thing about uh, Zoom and the talk is that, so like, uh, remember algorithm, it's like for, for those of you who did programming in college, right? Remember algorithm course, right? That is pretty hard, right? And especially this is what, like 6.30 for you? Like that is really difficult. So it's not just algorithms are difficult to understand. And so my hope is that if I don't just talk into the void for an hour, but instead we kind of interact a little bit, it will be easier to follow. That's the only purpose of this whole thing. Um, 
I'm just actually curious, like, let's, so let's actually try Like, if you wrote any SIMD, can you do this thingy in the chat? Like, whatever, clap hands, raise fingers, I don't know, something. And like, I'm going to see it or not. No, no, sorry, not in the chat. I don't see the chat. So in the, what's it called? Was... Yes, what, what class is doing? So there should be reactions <laughs> indeed. At the bottom of your screen, you'll find the reactions uh, button and you can clap, uh, celebrate, laugh, etc. So this is what Dennis is looking for. Yes. <laughs> okay, cool. I see one hand. Fantastic. A uh, two. I see two hands. Awesome. Uh, three, four. Nice. Some people are very upset about being doing CMD at one point in their life. Like I understand that, but <laughs> okay. So uh, hopefully, if you want to ask a question at any point, like I, I see the thing on the left. Uh, and I will hopefully see your hand raised or like uh, Klaus also wants us to chat for me and he will be able to ask a question on your behalf or we'll figure it out as we go. Okay. So um, you can find the slides on tinyurl.com slash dy meet cpp 2023. I will post this in the chat afterwards. Um, yeah. <clears throat> what this is about? Right. Uh, but basically, if you want to learn how to write SIMD algorithms, it's just, um, it's not a trivial task. You have to go in different places like Stack Overflow and blogs and stuff. There's not like a course or a book. This is the closest thing you can get, right, to that. Uh, when I'm going to cover a few kind of classic algorithms implemented with SIMD. Uh, specifically, we're going to do memcmp, uh, copy if, set intersection, and sort. It's okay if you don't know what SIMD is by this point, like you will see in a moment. All right. So let's start with memcmp. And uh, <clears throat> so this, this is memcmp, right? It takes two uh, arrays and it was to compare them. There are two standard algorithms you can use here. Can anybody name them? Actually, like, let me open the chat. I can do it in the chat. Can I see the chat? No, I can't see. Yeah, I can see the chat. There are two algorithms you can, standard algorithms you can use from standard libraries that would help you write standard memcmp, which would be. No, memcmp is not copy. Memcmp is comparing two arrays for equality. Mismatch, a mismatch is great. Equal is not uh, quite because it has, it returns less than zero. If it's less, zero and greater. But mismatch is great as one. There's another one from C20. That one is called standard lexicographical compare freeway. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so student mismatch is the correct one, yes. And if you look inside, what you will see is something like this. Sorry. And yeah. So it's uh, just, you know, go through both arrays, right? And take element, compare them one by one. Like, you know, this is the code that they write. Do you think you can write this faster? Do you think you can write an algorithm that will do this better than comparing uh, just elements byte by byte? Zoom has a remarkable amount of screens to move around. Any ideas how to make this faster? Do erase. I don't. Uh, OpenMP, like yes, but OpenMP we will do. We will do what OpenMP will do for you. Ah, uh, no, no, OpenMP will not do it. Ah, uh, like at least none of the OpenMP implementation I tried will do this correctly. So, um. Yes, yes, but wait, like just, just standard C++, no IVX, no, nothing, just, just, just wait. Like... Okay, so how about we just use an, in... yes, thank you, thank you, no, no, thank you very much, UN64. Let's take UN64 and compi, uh, compare UN64. Split into multi-thread is fantastic. Yes, compare words along, also awesome. Both are options, exactly what I'm doing, looking for. So now, like, do you think 
that if you write this by hand, it will be better or that the compiler should do it for you. Compiler, okay. Two people think compiler. Cool. You can, I don't know, like we will figure out signaling at some way, right? It's still implementer. It's still implementer. Uh, would be nice, right? Truth is, no one will, right? <laughs> like, uh, this is standard mismatch, uh, compiled with all three. Uh, and like, uh, this is lib still C plus, lib C plus plus, but I have not seen any standard. Uh, that's okay, cool. <laughs> so, any standard libraries that would actually do it, maybe Microsoft does nowadays. I haven't checked that, they have some. But this is in 64. So this is whatever I wrote using in 64, basically, as we discussed here. Right. And this, and I'm sorry, I have to move again the zoom things, is a standard memcmp from C. Right. If we compare the results here, this is about four times faster than in 64 and about 30 times something times faster than the standard mismatch from the standard library. Right. Uh, but uh, the truth is that it's actually not very different from what we did within 64s, except it can use like really wide registers. So I know on my machines it can use 32 byte registers. And so the implementation of memcmp or, uh, will use 32 byte registers and will be faster uh, because of it. Okay. Now, can anybody guess? Uh, there are two reasons, none of them good. Why wouldn't compiler do it for you? Like a standard library could just do it, but like why wouldn't compiler do it for you? No, I do all three. Like minus minus O zero, it's not very interesting, right? Like <laughs> uh anything anything would could be a factor only if you write thing. But if you read thing, anything should not be a problem. You can read from the same address multiple times. Uh, two things I can think of. One is like imagine how you write this loop. Yes, thank you, MKB. So accessing memory after the first mismatching byte was found. Right. So basically, imagine how this would be written. Right. So you have four while uh, well four i equals zero i not equal n. Right. Uh, and then you compare the bytes. And so basically, it's not a loop go through everything, compare every element. It's a loop until the until n or until the mismatch is found. There is a C standard library function that behaves like that. Who can name that one? C comparison function for two arrays that behaves exactly like this, that you give a limit and it finds the difference. Yes, Esther and Zimpia, thank you very much, Nuno. Uh, okay. Uh, yes, and that one is vectorized. I'm not gonna explain how. Uh, sorry, using those white registers, right, is vectorization. Is uh, those white registers are called CMD registers uh, because they kind of represent a lot of data. So vectorization, CMD, this is what we're talking about. So yes, Esther and CMP is written using those wide registers. I'm not gonna explain now how, but I can do afterwards if you want me to. All right. So what we want to do is we want to write this type of code. There are many ways to try to get exposure to, so, so to use those really wide registers. So there are many ways to try to get exposure to those wide registers. We're gonna use Eve library. Somebody mentioned intrinsics, um, you can try to do auto vectorization. Those are also ways to do it. Um, yeah. So if library is uh, maintained by Joel Falcou, uh, jean Trilla Laprest, and me. And um, this is, however, like the library doesn't matter here. Like whatever you use to do the CMD algorithms, they will do the same. They should do the same thing, right? If you want to talk about the library, it is there. It's called CMD in C++20, if of a new era. The link will be in the end. Uh, yeah, for um, and in that library there is 
a mismatch algorithm I wrote at one point. So let's have a look. As we mentioned, mismatch should do what we want. Let's have a look how that performs compared to what we just saw. So this is in 64s, right? This is standard MEMCMP. This is my mismatch. So it's a little bit slower than standard MEMCMP. However, uh, if we look at the M1, it's actually substantially faster than standard MEMCMP, which I'm enormously proud of. I can explain why, but I'm not going to do now. Basically, I'm trying to prove that we're doing roughly the correct thing. <laughs> yeah. um, one thing of note, right, that I mentioned, you know, on this machine, on that machine, right? The thing is that CMD is extensions. Like it's not just default, pro not all processors have extensions and not all processors have the same extensions, right? Now, this is some uh, list of all of the uh, possible extensions that Eve, for example, tries to target in some way or other. Um, inspires it, <laughs> inspires it. Right? Um, I'm not going to explain how it, and it is, because it's extensions, it's important to compile to correct extensions. I'm not going to explain how, but I'm going to show you why it's important. So this is the same computer, right? This is just all free. This is compiled correctly. It's a 2x difference. Both of them are better than uh, in 64s, right? Because we even in an absolutely default processor, we can do some things, uh, but two times difference is important. So what's inside mismatch? Well, actually, if is a ranges library. So inside mismatch, it's just called find if with a zip which is awesome. We took a lot of time to make that work, uh, but it doesn't explain how the algorithm works. So let's have a look at as if we were writing this from scratch. I'm going to hide the chat because it bothers me at the moment. A lot of things on my screen. Um, yes. Okay. So imagine this is the middle of the loop where you compare two arrays. Step one, we want a big register. In if a big register is called wide. Uh, and so this will be platform specifically correct uh, register. On my machine, it will be 32 bytes, right? Step one, we're gonna load uh, this register from both, uh, from both arrays, like similar how we did in the picture. And then we're gonna compare them. So in uh, uh, CMD libraries, uh, typically the comparison will not return you just one Boolean, but it will return you a bunch of Booleans. So in here, in an example, right, the second element, so the first elements are equal, so they'll be uh, not equal will return false. And the second elements are not equal, so not equal will return true, right? Uh, then we do what we call the first true. So uh, it, it's an operation on this, so on this uh, wide on this register. Uh, that returns the position of the first true element. So, for example, here it will be, uh, you know, this true. So it's going to be one, right? If there is no matches, it's going to return null opt. Uh, and then basically, okay, what happens if we didn't find any matches? We should go to the next thirty-two bytes, and this is what we do. We go no matches, take plus thirty-two bytes in each pointer, and go again. Otherwise, uh, we found a match, we need to figure out where we stopped. So we do plus to the match and we return true. Let me actually leave you to look at this code for a second and you can ask me something about it if you want to. I'm going to assume it somewhat makes sense. And if it doesn't, oh, okay. How does it know A and A of B? So uh, the outside loop will figure that out. Here, I just know uh, this is in, inside the loop I'm showing you. So the, the outside world will have to figure out how where the end of those are. This is, this is not smart. This just loads whatever. My machine will just load 32 bytes. So the outside loop has to figure out, okay, we try okay. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the outside loop has to know the wide size. It can just say wide colon colon size. It's a context per thing. I'm, this is an illustration. It's not really how uh, cool. No worries. All right. So let's talk about first true for a second. Right, because it is important to understand how, how it's implemented uh, for us to make further progress. One caveat that this is not on ARM SV. ARM SV is this new family of CMD extensions and they are very different from everything else. So they do separate things. Everywhere else goes and looks like this. So we had this you know, comparison result, right? Uh, this guy. And it's actually gonna be some specialized register. And in this case, what we want is going to be like our specialized register with 32 Booleans. And what we want is we want to find position of this Boolean. Okay. Um, step one, on many platforms, there is an instruction called any to tell you if there is any true at all. And if there isn't one, we're just going to go loop again, right? So this is basically going to be this bit. So, right, we do, okay. If there is not an any, we do not much, go again, right? Plus 32 bytes go again. Otherwise, if there isn't any, we do this operation that we called building top bits. So, okay, this is a CMD register. However, this is an integer. Uh, so there is a one or two instructions usually you can do to go from this CMD register to an integer where one bit represents a Boolean value. It's not quite one bit. Sometimes it's more efficient to be like two bits per value or four bits per value, but we pretend on the surface that it is one bit, right? And then like, if you have an integer, how do you can find the position of this value? That, this distance, how do you find it? The C++ standard function, or you maybe know an instruction or a built-in. Bit tops. Well, which one? <laughs> mm, I don't think that will work, but what we want is count trailing zeros. Bits come forward sometimes, it's called different names. In standard library, it's called count trailing zeros. And this will return you to because it will count. Well, you know, bits come forward. I, I didn't mean to. Uh, it's okay. Uh, so um, n equals uh, no, no I, n, n and n minus one is not quite that. Count trailing zeros is has to be an instruction, and most platforms is an instructions. But it was before. So there's a built-in if you don't have a C plus plus twenty. It's called TTL and whatever. Okay. So this is our first true. Basically, it's an any followed by construction of top bits and followed by uh, count trailing zeros. Uh, to be clear, sometimes any, uh, sometimes top building top bits is so cheap that uh, this will just be top bits and count trailing zeros. So for example, just to make sure that I'm kind of not saying anything incorrectly, this is um, whatever this code compiled for x86. This is building top bits. Uh, well, there's a not because we want to not much go to the top, right? And there's a test. This is your any, right? And this is your bits can forward. Uh, yes, this is your count trailing zeros. All right. There is a proposal for the C++ standard of standard CMD. Let's talk about this for a second. So what we call wide, they call uh, standard CMD. What we call load, they call they have a method called copy from. What we call logical, uh, they call CMD mask. They have the same operator overloads. And finally, what we call first true, they split into two functions. They have any of function, and they have a function reduce mean index that requires any of to be true. Uh, I'm perfectly fine with this. The only caveat is I think reduce mean index is a fairly horrible name. 
Uh, it was called find first set or something. I think that's much better. And um, that is it for MemCMP. If you have a question about MemCMP, let's do it now. Why does it get the reference to pointers or not? Okay. Uh -huh. So uh, this is, uh, again, like imagine this is a, this is tries to be, uh, um, this is not the entire function. This is just a, uh, a middle of the loop. And what middle of the loop it should do, it should advance by 32 bytes if it's not found, otherwise it returns where it's found. So if it's not found, it advances by 32 bytes and otherwise it advances to specifically find place. All right. The interface was just to illustrate the point, like it's not, it's not the production interface. Because this code is compiled by Clang 16. We support Clang 15. Uh, Clang 15, GCC, uh, MSVC, not so much yet, but we're working on it. All right. All right, let's move on just so that we can make some progress. And let's talk about copy if. <clears throat> the first time I kind of, I saw this idea, I was like, whoa, how, how is this even possible? How can you possibly do copy if? Copy makes sense. You load a big register, store a big register. But how do you copy if? Well, there is this notion of compress. It's how it looks. You have a register and you have a mask, right? And then what we do is we store only the selected elements and we store them like all together in the beginning. And then we do something with the rest. We don't care as well. The reason I call this a notion of compress and not like a compress function is it because uh, sometimes it can be very inefficient. So in fact, in if what we do is we have a bunch of different functions, all have the word compress in the name, and then we use the appropriate one depending on the situation. The one we want here is called compress copy. Here it comes, look. Now you have a pointer, an array, uh, and an output point. And then you have a mask. And what we'll do is it will copy only the selected elements. And after it's done, it will return you where it stopped, right? So if you had this element, this element, this element, this element selected, it will copy them out here close together and returns you where where's the out went? If you have this function, do you think you can write a copy if? Like who who somebody say if they think they can write a copy if using this? Yeah, so Klaus can. Yeah, it's fairly it should be fairly straightforward. So you you kind of like you just compress copy, compress copy, compress copy, compress copy, and you're done. Uh, very caveat. So one is, uh, sorry, there are a few variations. One is a safe unsafe. So uh, unsafe basically allows the function to write a bit of extra garbage to the end um, up to register size because this is much more efficient. Safe doesn't do that. So, but safe is slower because of it. The other one is that uh, there is sparse and dense variations. Sparse uh, basically says how many uh, matches do you expect in the register? Do you expect a lot of matches? Do you expect very few matches? And then sparse is really good for when you expect a few matches. So let's talk about the interface of standard copy for a second. So this is the interface of standard copy. First, last output iterator. I'm missing the predicate here. I'm sorry about that. Uh, predicate returns an output iterator. This is a perfectly valid interface or a scalar code. However, for SIMD, this O is a big problem because what it means is that I can never know how many elements are actually available in the output. And it means I can never use unsafe, right? This requires safe. And this is a big, this is deal breaker. The copy will not be fast. I asked, uh, uh, there is a C++ 20, there is a uh, standard on six. It is not really implemented, but 
it provides at least a standard and seek copy copy if with and seek policy, which should be doing what we're talking about here, but it's pushing in this issue. So I asked about it. The idea there is that unseek is allowed to allocate. So what will happen is that unseek will allocate the buffer, copy if there, right? And then copy from the buffer to the output. That's obviously slower, but under certain circumstances might be faster than just scaling. No, not unseek. Uh, it's spelled as uh, unseek. I try to put in chat. It's unsequenced. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, like um, it's not really a thing. Like it's a standard, but it's not really like doing anything. Okay, well let's come back. This is if copy if right. So the difference is that if is ranges based, and if we are ranges based again, some immediately predicate. Uh, then uh. Uh, because we're range space, we can know how many elements we can write. One interesting thing about the interface here is that, like, think about it. Imagine you have a million elements, and you copy in an arrange with two elements. So what you want to do is you want to copy if until you count the two elements, then you stop, and then you return to the user. So the user can do something, free up the space, and copy again. Right, so what you would like to do is you would like to return where you stop. However, uh, I just couldn't make it work. It's just hard. <laughs> so uh, for now, we just return your output iterator, and if the whole range didn't fit you, kind of, we just won't tell you. All right, let's talk about how compressed copy is implemented. Uh, there are two versions. One is kind of as pure SIMD, and that is way too much to explain here. So I'll just give you some pointers. Uh, on for fancy uh, platforms, like if you have IBX 512 uh, or you have um, ARM SVE, there are just specialized instructions that are called compress, and you can just do this as an instruction. Uh, for most platforms, we use uh, a method with tiny lookup tables developed by Stack Overflow user Akrit. Uh, it's really clever. Uh, then uh, when BMI2 is available, which is a family of instructions on x86, we use that. Uh, and finally, when nothing else works, there's just a switch, right? The switch and like, okay, this is the mask, this is the mask, and do um, appropriate shuffles. Uh, Zipazon suggested one version of Tech Overflow, we use a slightly different one. The other one is a CMD scalar one, and this one I can explain. So uh, this is our input, output, mask. Right. Um, let's construct top bits from this mask. And let's do exactly first true, right? What we did. So, okay, this is the first element. Let's copy it. This is the second, like clear the last bit, count trailing zeros again, copy the second element. So if you have very few matches, like one or two, Per mask, this is very, very good. I have production use cases for some. Uh, let's have a look at the numbers. Ah, sorry. The uh, this was independently suggested by Peter Cartes and Eliarder. I'm actually curious, uh, like I don't know, make some signal in the chat if you know Peter Cardes or about Peter Cardes. I don't know, like somehow. Have you encountered the name of Peter Cardes? Yes, <laughs> yeah, this is just something. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Like as a person answers more Stack Overflow x86 questions than I think everybody else combined. We really appreciate his work. <laughs> okay, if you go and I said just just anything about x86 processes, you'll find his answers pretty good. All right. Um. So let's have a look at this. Uh, like. This is a benchmark for copy if, for standard copy if, no, no seemed yet. As this is no elements copied, this is all of the elements copied. This is half the elements copied, right? Does anything strike you as weird about this benchmark? What is the worst case should be for copy if?
option is top is hundred percent and other ideas. All elements again. Yes, thank you, Anton. Half. So branch predictor, branch predictor, you guys. Branch predictor should be the worst case. So this is so this is we'll come back to that. Here is just two little elements. So the my benchmark just remembers everything. But no, writing is not the problem. Branches are here. Okay, so let's have a look. Uh, this is the the like the one we look at CMD scalar, right? The sparse one. Uh, and you can see it's really good when things are sparse. So you can do five times speed up compared to just standard copy if. This is whatever new time speed up. Uh, here it's obviously goes bad because it's sparse. And this is CMD CMD approach. And CMD CMD approach is um is really consistently good, right? And gives you what? This is three times speed up, for example, right? And it uh, doesn't depend on data as much, but here it's not as good when you have uh, sparse data, so sparse matrix. This is shorts. And shorts, for shorts, uh, like my computer no longer can remember all of the branches. And so you see the spike. And then when you see the spike, the difference between the CMD uh, scalar approach and CMD approach is more than 10 times because uh, CMD, CMD relies on some tricks. It has, it's branchless. Well, it's not quite branchless, but it's every, every branch is perfectly predicted. There is no kind of tricks to it. Um, yeah, so like can be substantial, right? Uh, here it's uh, again 2x speed up even if it's perfectly predicted. Um, okay. Uh, this is M1. Uh, so you can see that for uh, for integers, uh, the scalar approach, uh, the, the, the simply scalar approach didn't do anything. Yeah, that is because of branch mispredictions. Uh, we can talk more about branch mispredictions if you want to, but yes, that is exactly what's uh, what's happening. It can no longer predict if you copy half the elements. It can no longer predict which elements you copy. Uh, if if you perfectly copy every other one, then yeah, it will be able to. But generally speaking, no. Um, yeah, but here we for simply simply approach on M one gives you uh, like four x speed up, right? Which is very good. Uh, and for shorts, I just really like that on M one it draws an M, which I think is kind of cute. Um, okay. <laughs> so what about the standard proposal? Well, in standard, there's a proposal for a compress function. And I mentioned that compress function can be very inefficient. There are two things here. One is that as a standard guys kind of have different philosophy about things, but generally speaking, like uh, maybe some of it will be able to optimize because there's like clear intent here. Also, when you get the standard, you will get like, you know, when, when do you think you will be able to write C++ 26? In five years, in six years? Let's see what the computers uh, be here. It's a, it's a logical, right? So we, what the, what the question is, what will mask represent? So you have um, values you want to, um, give me a sec. Yeah, this is a mask. So this is values, this is mask, this is the result. Um, okay. Uh, so, so yeah, so one is that maybe in uh, five, six years, the computers will be better. And then like all of the modern computers should have some form of this pretty well. Worst case scenario, you have to know, can you use it or can you not use it? Like that's, but it's maybe fine. All right. Actually, I'm gonna skip set intersection. I'm gonna leave that to last because I think that's the hardest one to understand. And we're gonna do sort now, unless you have a copy, uh, copy if question. Let's do, do you have a copy if question? Uh, standard algorithm never have seen the implications. Not quite. Um, so standard algorithms can can can, can um, so, 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 so some uh, sometimes standard algorithms are uh, they, they, okay. So specific ones like uh, on some platforms, like for example, Microsoft vectorized some like so things like 
uh, standard reverse on Microsoft for integers will be factorized. Or um, if you look at inside uh, libc++, uh, they will for find for integers, they will call the uh, vmm, whatever, there's this libc function, extend libc or four six functions that will do the find for integer. Um, yeah, but they only can vectorize cases which are specific, which have no predicates. Uh, the alternative is your compiler will do it for you. Now, auto vectorization uh, can do usually a transform, right? So go through the loop and do something to each element, or transform reduce, go through the loop and uh, accumulate something in an. With with some pragmas, for example, for floats, those the, the reductions can be done as well. And if you have one of those cases, uh, you should just rely on the standard algorithm, uh, on the standard, or on the compiler, or on standard algorithms. Absolutely. Uh, outside of that, I don't think I had seen anything uh, done. Uh, if you still have questions about the mask, let's do it at the end. I'm happy to show like just um, gun vault. We'll have a look. Let's do sort. Okay. So unlike other algorithms, I don't have an implementation of sort myself. It's just a lot of work. But uh, there are other people who did this, right? This is kind of all the things I read about the subject. I'm not gonna name everybody, I'm sorry, but I'm gonna like reference the specific people uh, who did specific work, uh, who I rely on. Uh, in order to do sort, the thing we need to learn to do is to sort one wide, one register. Uh, so the first time I saw this, the earliest I can see this is from this blog, uh, Seven Degrees of Freedom, uh, A Question of Sorts. <laughs> Let's have a look. So I'm going to explain how to sort two elements, and then I'm just going to wave my hands and say this is how we sort n elements. We have uh, two uh, elements, five and three. Step one, uh, sorry. Step one, we uh, do what's known as shuffle. We switch elements around. In this case, we swap them, three and five. And then we do min and max. Min and max are by lane. So five and three, five and three. Uh, it's going to be min, three, three, max, five, five. And then what we're going to do is we're going to blend. Right, blend is this kind of shuffle of two registers where we mix the elements from two registers. We take an element from here, take an element from here. Two elements sorted. Now the wave hands part, right? The combination of shuffle, min max, and blend are enough to sort the register. Why do we need shuffle that? So uh, uh, the min and max, they are by lane, so you need to do three, uh, um, meaning that you, you do this this way, three and five, this way. Not, 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 does it make sense? Like you, 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 um, yeah, thank you very much. All right. All right. Uh, so I'm not going to explain how to do this. Like I have the code. But the main idea is, uh, so there's a, the class of algorithms called sorting networks. And specifically, uh, the algorithms that everybody's using called Pythonic sort, right? And that's just to implement them everywhere. Okay. Now, who can name me components of quick sort? I want three, or three components of quick sort sub algorithm. I'm split. Okay, let's say partition. Pivot. Gershon. Partition, yes, fantastic. Pivot selection. The other two. The third one is always hard. Uh, recursion, I, I don't know. But the main, the third component of quicksort is that no quicksort, no reasonable quicksort goes to the end. 
they always stop at some point and go insertion sort. So pivot selection, partition, and insertion sort. Let's think, let's think about this one for a second. So we know at this point how to sort a register. So how about we do whatever partition and then leave up to a register size, right? In partition chunks. Well, now we can go and just sort those registers and we're done, right? So kind of insertion sort is covered by it. Uh, let's look at the other two. Let's start with period selection. Uh, so this one I take from uh, Intel CMD sort library. Maybe people heard of it. Uh, the person with the most lines when I look was uh, Ravir Dilupali. I'm very sorry about that. Uh, but I'm not sure who is actually the main author there. Uh, this is what they do. I, okay, can everybody think like maybe, ah, whatever, I can just show. Uh, so like we have an array, right? We need to select a, no, actually, like, okay. Can, can uh, who can name me a pivot selection algorithm? Like. Some some pivot selection algorithm. Choose first. That's not bad. But CMD doesn't help us here. Like I wouldn't tell you about say choose first. Random, like random CMD. I I don't know. Also, random can help. But those, those are good ones. Any other? Middle. Yeah. There's actually well, there's, there's the most famous one. Right. Median of five. Median of five is a bit heavy. Uh, but usually what people actually do is they pick a few elements and they select like, well, they take like three elements and they sort those three and select the middle one, right? So that kind of try to minimize the chances that they're going to push really to the end. Mm, maybe. <laughs> okay, so, and this is where SteamD can help. So what we can do is we can select a bunch of elements in CMD, in, in, in Intel library, what they do is they go with equal step, right? This is supposed to be equal step. They so load all of those in a register using an operation called gather, right? It's just take a bunch of positions and load them all together in the register. Then they sort that one, and then they pick the middle one. And this is going to be pretty good pivot on them, right? So the reason I mention it is because I want to talk about Gaza. Uh, like first time I saw Gaza, I thought this is amazing. Like I thought this is operations that's gonna be solution to all my problems. I'm just gonna write all of my algorithms like this. You, you can do amazing things if you've got a really good Gaza. Unfortunately, we don't. Gaza is quite slow. Um, like is some people, I never managed to use it successfully. Some people do. But they always kind of like, okay, we're going to upset the price of expensive gather with something. Else. And it's not like, it's not like you can do anything, right? So uh, you have two load buffer. Like you can do two loads per cycle if everything can catch, maybe, right? I'm not a bit on a shaky territory here, right? So you need to load all those elements, right? And uh, there's no escaping from loading those elements. Anyways. Okay, let's talk about partition. So partition I'm taking from this blog by Dan Shekka. Uh, this goes to 11. And this is hard. So try to understand some of it and like hand wave the other part. Okay, uh, let's say this is our array. What we're gonna do is we're going to first step one, throw away two registers on the side, which is gonna put them somewhere on the stack and we're gonna not care about them. We're gonna deal with them separately. Step two, take a register and sort it. And then find, uh, so you have a pivot somewhere. All the elements to the left of the line are smaller than the pivot. All the elements greater than the pivot are to the right of the line. So this is like, we we do this with first row. We can do this with first row. What we just did is we partitioned a register using a sort, which is inefficient. So sometimes, quite often, you can do better than sort to partition the register. Uh, but in a general case, 
this will be this will work. Right. Now that we partition the register, uh, let's uh, let, let's have a look at our array. So here we have two registers worth of space because one we stored away on the stack, one we just took. Here we have one register worth of space. Let's write uh, this register in both places. What do we get? We get everything here is already partitioned. Everything here is already partitioned. All this is less than pivot because the original register is less than pivot. All of this is greater than pivot. All of this is garbage. We can write over it. So now all we need to do is we need to select the next register as a way that we can uh, continue this process. And we're going to select it from this side because here we don't have enough space for register. And now when we take this one and we sort this one, we partition this one, we will. Um, so this is tricky. I'll give you a moment to look at probably this one. And you tell me if you have a question. But it's, it's, it takes some time to think about. Like it's not a trivial algorithm. All right. So actually, this is done with sort because I don't have an algorithm. I don't have the benchmarks. The word 10x gets thrown around a lot, uh, but uh, benchmarking sorts is notoriously difficult. Like it's it's a very hard problem. Um, okay. Think if you have a question about sort because otherwise we're gonna go to uh, set intersection. This is what I meant by the talk is quite dense. Like I suspect a substantial number of you, like it's quite hot here, which was a mistake. But now I'm already, I'm trying to fall asleep and I'm wondering, like I suspect a substantial number of you are trying to. Okay. So let's do set intersection uh, if nobody has a question. Uh, well, I don't have a performance results because uh, I, don't have an implementation, right? So the word 10x is is being thrown around. Like so, some some um, NumPy when NumPy started using Intel sort, they're like, oh, we got a 10x speed up. But this all depends on the use case. Like sort is notoriously notoriously hard. All right. So let's do set intersection. Sorting to okay by sensitive. It's the, the combination of merge. Uh, um, it scales up. So the, if you can know if you can sort two two elements, you can scale up to sort four. You can scale up to sort uh, using the same blend merge and uh, uh, blend min max and uh, uh, shuffle. Uh, there's an algorithm called Pythonic sort that shows you how to do it. I'm just it's just difficult to explain like it's it's a tr tricky algorithm uh, not not terribly tricky it's like 20 lines a lot of operations ah well you sort eight elements right sorting eight elements is a lot of operations or 16 elements is a lot of operations it's not it can be good enough right so again you you try um we'll actually talk about uh, counting operations in a second uh, but yeah of course uh, you have to try and test. Uh, and uh, also, a lot of the time, this will only be for the end stage with insertion sort. Uh, for the main part, you might be able to just do something more clever. With part just partition doesn't quite require sorting. It requires a small operation. All right. Let's talk about center, center intersection. To my surprise, not everybody's very familiar with standard algorithms, and not everybody knows what standard set intersection does. Let's have a look. It's a merge algorithm. So it takes two sorted arrays, and it goes through them one by one. And like, think about merge algorithms. So you increase the smallest one, right? and when it finds the equal elements, it writes to the output. Because it's arrays, 
you can have duplicates. And standard algorithms specify what happens with duplicates. We will not go to because otherwise, uh, I, 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 but we're not going to. We're just going to say between one and all of the duplicates will be. Right, and then we go. Okay, we can take the smallest one. Uh, take the smallest one. Take the smallest one. Uh, whatever until we encounter the uh another equal elements merge algorithm with writing down the equals. Uh, there are two implementations. One is going to be CMD scale. So this array, uh, it's perfect. It it works well when you have one small array and one big array. From the small array, I'm going to take just one element, and from the big array, we're going to take a whole register. And now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do something known as broadcast. I'm going to take this element. I'm going to write it into every uh, lane, every position of this register, and then we're going to compare. So think about this. In the normal scalar way, what you do is you compare element with element. Right? Here, what we're doing is we're being optimistic. Instead of comparing one element with one element, we're going to compare one element against the whole bunch. Right? We're going to compare this one element against all of this. And if we lock out, if it's smaller, if it's like, you know, not, not smaller than any of them, then we'll just, uh, then we can just, uh, you know, completely discard all of these guys. If all of these are smaller than this guy, like we can completely discard all of them and just advance uh, this pointer. Otherwise, let's say we maybe we there's a match. Okay, let's test. If there is a match, we're going to write it to the output. And uh, and then we can advance the F1 because uh, I could already had a match. Uh, thank you. Uh, so, uh, yeah, this, the second one is, uh, CMD, CMD, and this one comes from a paper, uh, called, uh, faster than native alternative for x86 with p2 intersect instruction. All right. Uh, written, uh, by, uh, Guillermo Diaz Camus. So this is the idea of a paper. We're going to have Two register, uh, two two rays, uh, and this time we don't care about the relative sizes. So, what we uh, uh, what we do is we're going to take a register from each one, and then we're going to do a very expensive operation called has equal in, where we're going to take every element from this guy and compare against every element here, and then we're just going to compress copy based on this mask. So everything, uh, yeah, this is. This is us intersecting two registers. Now that we intersected two registers, all we need to do is advance. Where we can advance? Well, let's look at this element. So this element, uh, we, we can try to, we will try to find it in this register. Like uh, um, it's already intersected or not? It doesn't matter. We're gonna try to find it where it lands. So it can land here right before, then we can not advance this guy though. It can land here, then we can advance F2 completely, or it can land somewhere in the middle. And what does it mean? It means that this guy is uh, partitioning this, basically anything after this element will have to come after this position, right? Because it was sorted. So we can advance F2. And same way, it's absolutely symmetrical with advance F1. This may or may not make sense, but look how it looking. Uh, how the duplicates are handled to, to all to all CMD comparisons? This is why we kind of uh, ignore uh, the duplicates in the specification, because uh, basically sometimes uh, sometimes it will happen that you or I end up in situations that one element matches against two elements. Right, so in one element, it'd be one element equal three, and the other will be true, equal three, and both of them will be marked. Um, it can also happen that the registers overlap and kind of, there is no way to, to do it reasonably. Let's look at has equal in, and this is where I mentioned that we don't to talk about a lot of operations so on. It's actually not fancy. What it does, it compares each element from here with each element from here, just um, 
yeah. So I'm just going to, in this case, I'm showing as a rotate. So I'm going to rotate this register four times. And I'm going to compare against each of the rotations and I'm going to combine them all together. This seems like a lot of operations, all right? However, let's think about it. So uh, I could do, like, this is not always a rotation, but you can always make it to one instruction. So this is one instruction, this is one instruction, this is one instruction. Uh, this is an expensive instruction, goes to port five on x86, with whoever knows who those are. This is not that bad. So uh, basically what I'm saying is that all these free instructions can likely execute on one cycle. So I think that this is, can be done a substantial number of times in the number of cycles there is elements in the register. In the paper, uh, because they target uh, really fancy instructions, what they managed to do is they combine equal and or into one instruction. Uh, but I don't have the hardware, so I'm not doing it. Okay. Let's look at uh, benchmarks. This is standard set intersection, right? Uh, the benchmark looks like this. You have two arrays of the total size 20,000 elements. Oh, sorry, it's 20,000 bytes. It's uh, 5,000 elements. Uh, I'm going to split the split in two arrays that we merge. On the left, first array is small. The right, uh, second array is really big. So it's um, um, it's 5% uh, over half. Like it's 2.5% versus negative. Okay. Here is the elements, are, is array, is the arrays are equal size. Hmm. The difference between this and this part is mostly branch predictor because here it can predict that we'll also take the element from the second array. And here it predict, can predict no such thing because uh, it either or it jumps around. Now let, let's look at some number, uh, at uh, some algorithm. So uh, we're going to start with SIMD SIMD approach, the second one I showed you. Uh, sorry. Uh, yeah. Uh, so there's uh, two variations uh, depending on which compress we're using. And here on the left, well, you can have uh, like this is about a quarter faster. This is about when there's e roughly equal. This is about four times faster, the CMD CMD approach. The CMD scalar approach performs ridiculously well, right? So on the left, it's uh, when it's supposed to be good, like when you take one element, this is one element against many elements. So this is like, uh, well, it's not 20, but it's not far off, like, I don't know. More than 10, less than 20, something like that, times faster. Um, and here it's still, despite it's being kind of not best case where one element comes through big array anyways, it still gives you a 4x speed up. Uh, on M1, uh, the CMT CMT approach didn't uh, give us anything. Uh, however, the CMT scalar approach continues to perform excellent. So this is uh 16 times faster something like that this is uh two and a half times faster yeah so so really really good in defense of uh paper authors right so they didn't they didn't try this approach to simply scalar one uh but um i think in their case so the difference between the m1 and x86 is mostly is mainly is the register size so on m1 there are 16 byte registers it's a 32 byte register in the paper, and, and you can see that CMD CMD approach performs better here than this uh, com compared to, relatively better compared to M1. So I expect that maybe with even larger register size, it will be performing even better. And maybe if you take it to the machine where the authors paper write it, it will be, uh, the, they will finally switch. Okay. If you have a question about set intersection, I can try to answer it. Okay, then. Uh, I'm gonna thank uh, Joel Falcu and Jean Trila Prest who do the library with me. And I, you know, it's really cool that I have people to do open source with. 
And all the amazing people who share their research online, like coming up with an algorithm is a lot of work and then compared to just re-implementing it or whatever, and we really appreciate their work. Uh, and finally, the links, right? Uh, um, let me post this in the chat. Um, uh, something happened. Yeah, so uh, there is uh, the library uh, which the algorithms implemented on GitHub. Uh, there is the slides. Um, there is uh, another talk I gave about CMD algorithms uh, that covers just different algorithms. Um, there's a talk about the library. And then finally, if you want to talk about CMD with people on CMD Lang uh, Slack, there is a CMD channel and it's really low volume and high, uh, uh, very informative. It's, uh, very low volume, very informative. I recommend it if this is something you're interested in. And with that said, um, so people who are alive, I'm happy to. <laughs> All right. So first of all, thank you very much. I think this was great. And I particularly enjoyed the pictures. This really helps so much to, to understand what's going on. Now, thank I really, you. It I took really so much. Have, so I would like to open this for questions. And indeed, uh, please feel free to also um, ask questions live because you now here in Zoom, we have the opportunity. Is there anything that you would be interested in? Can I have just two minutes to just have a breather? Okay, so okay. Um, let's let's uh, wait for a couple of minute questions, then we can close the talk, and then indeed let's do a short break, and then we do the after talk chat. All okay, right. Well, yeah. Let, questions. Okay, there's one in the chat. Uh, in Vasm. Oh my God. So uh, to be <laughs> fair, uh, yeah, that that. Um, uh, so we tried. Which 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 we tried wasn't, uh, but like so th that's a mistake on a slide. I I said the thing incorrectly. So I said that this is most things that support. No, this is examples. Uh, wasn't we tried like two or three times and we uh, uh, failed because the environment wasn't there. So we encountered things like you try to execute an instruction and crashes in horrible ways. There is some person that picked up to do Wasm again and then disappeared. This is very common in open source. Like, no, no, not kind of person, just common. So somebody has to go and try again. I don't think it's it's that bad as you think compared to, let's say, SSC2. SSC2 is very bad. Um, you can, you can do very limited things. So Vasm at least has a table instruction, right, in some shape or form. Uh, so it's okay. But um, yes, the final fallback, if nothing else work, will be emulation. But I try we try not to go there because if you go emulation effectively, it means you are, well, substantial number of times you're slower than the scalar case, right? So just just loses a complete point. How much is gathered? 1% size. I I think that's misunderstanding of what gather is. Gather loads the entire think. Um, so gather is like a load from many uh, uh, from many positions, right? So if you have eight positions, gather will take, I don't remember the interface. It's like takes eight indexes to find first center. Okay, let's let's look at the uh as a code right as a picture right uh, i think right so uh ah i think i understand they do one register so if it is this is actually also a weird decision by them and i'm like why would they do that because so in the same register same registers are always bite sized uh so certain bite size so for example they be uh 32 bytes right so you can do 16 shorts or eight ints right and what they do in Intel, instead of just saying, well, we're just going to do eight always, they say we're going to do the, um, however we can fit into the register. So they will be loading twice as many shorts as they do ints. But what that means is uh, that they will actually, uh, basically they do twice as many loads. Like the gather for shorts, I suspect is slower than the gather for ints, at least if it's going to be emulated. And sometimes it has to be emulated with just scalar loads. That's definitely much worse. So, but they just kind of arbitrarily decide to do uh, the partition. I'm not sure this is a good idea. Like, I just 
I saw them doing it. It makes sense. But how to choose a correction partition a pivot algorithm, I, I don't even know. Like, I, I was thinking that when I'm going to do uh, sort, I'm just going to have some default, for example, this one. And I'm going to give you a way to hook into that and say, no, I'm going to do different pivot algorithm. Mm -hmm. Because I don't know how to choose correct one. <laughs> All right, let me, can I have like a minute and I'll be back. All right. So then officially, I now close the talk. Thank you very much. This was great. Um, I now also stop the recording. Then we indeed now do a one minute break. This might be necessary. But then please feel free to stay for the after talk chat. Now yeah, I'm uh, here to as much as, uh, as you want, uh, within reason. <laughs> All right. Thank All right. you.